right, if I could have your attention, please. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. It's Dr. Surya Ganguly from Stanford University, uh, where he's at the Department of Applied Physics, um, but he's um, also um, connected with their neurobiology and electrical engineering programs. Um, before that, he was a fellow at the Sloan Swartz Center for Theoro Theoretical Neurobiology at UC uh, San Francisco. He has spent time at um, the following uh, institutions. Um, actually, there are too many to mention, but um, I think uh, because of his uh, very fascinating work, he's been brought at, in as a, as a, as a visiting um, uh, scientist uh, at um, Harvard, Columbia, University College of London, um, and UC Santa Barbara, and many more. His Bachelor of Science is in uh, Physics, Math, and um, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Uh, he received uh, a Master's in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Both of those degrees are from MIT. Uh, he went on to do his PhD uh, and a Master's in Math, uh, but his PhD in Theoretical Physics from UC Berkeley, uh, where he also worked at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab. He is the recipient of many awards. I'll just mention a few. The McDonnell uh, Foundation Scholars Award, a Sloan Foundation Fellowship, and the Burroughs Welcome Career Award, among others. Um, I'm very fascinated with this topic, and I'm thrilled that we have someone talking about the, the physics of um, neurobiology. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Surya Ganguly. Thanks for the uh, kind intro. Um, so yeah, it's a total pleasure to be here. I've come to Sonoma many times, of course, to, to drink stuff, uh, but, but I've never actually been to this place. So it's, it's really nice to see such a vibrant physics community in the middle of uh, uh, Sonoma. Um, so I'm going to talk about, it's kind of a mishmash of topics, uh, but, but I'll, I'll try to give you kind of a tour as opposed to sort of the technical details. Um, so, so basically, why, why would a physicist be working in neuroscience, right? The title of the seminar is What Do Physicists Do? And you might not have thought that a physicist would work on, would work on neuroscience. It turns out there's a lot of physicists working on neuroscience. And the question is why? Like, wh why did they kind of switch, like myself, from, from physics to neuroscience? It's because uh, the types of skills that you're learning in physics and astronomy and, and so on, these technical mathematical skills, uh, how to build things, how to analyze things, are incredibly useful in biology right now. Because the landscape of biology has totally changed. It's radically shifted from when I was an undergrad. I actually didn't study biology as an undergrad because I thought it was kind of a soft subject. Like you just, you're kind of stamp collecting, you're kind of squishing things around. And <laughs> it, I felt like I wanted to do hardcore math or something like that. So I stayed away from biology. And, but that's changed now, right? So why has it changed? So one of the things is technology, right? So we know that you know, when Galileo built his microscope, that opened up the stars. It changed our conception of planetary motion and all that kind of stuff. In that sense, neuroscience is developing all sorts of new microscopes. Uh, well, Galileo built a telescope, but, but, but basically new ways of seeing uh, uh, neural systems, right? So there's a wide array of, of techniques now that really open up the complexity of neural systems from sort of the 10 centimeter scale of the size of your head down to the nanometer scale of the distances between molecules, right? Uh, so for example, you have multi-electrode recordings where you can stick about 100 electrodes, electrical electrodes into the brain and record the firings of individual neurons, right, while you're thinking, right? Uh, you have EEG that's a much more coarse-grained uh, thing where each electrode measures about 50,000 neurons. Uh, you have fMRI where you can measure blood flow through the entire brain. You have two photon imaging where you can actually image calcium in the brain. So you can tag specific neurons with calcium indicators. So, when, so whenever a neuron fires, calcium rushes in. And then if you insert an indicator into that neuron, that calcium will cause that indicator to fluoresce. And you can image that fluorescence. So you can literally see over a huge field of view, and you know, about a 200 micrometer field of view the set of neurons that are firing while a rat is doing stuff, right? Um, there's high throughput electron microscopy. So there are people trying to figure out the connectivity of, of your brain, well, really of animals' brains. Uh, you'll see why it's animals and not humans because of, of how they do it. They take the, the animal, they, they slice up its brain into very, very fine slices, and they take an electron microscopy picture of the brain. So now you have re re very, very fine resolution. And they're trying to use these images to reconstruct connectivity. 
optogenetics is actually something that was invented at Stanford. Um, have you guys heard about this? This is, this is where you can, it's this amazing thing where, actually, okay, so I'll, I'll go slower in this part of the talk because th there's so much background to talk about. So it turns out that bacteria have these amazing uh, opsins, right? That, so bacteria are cells that have a cell membrane, right? That separates the outside from the inside. And what these um, opsins do is you can shine light on these, on these opsins. The, these opsins are sort of transmembrane molecules inserted between the, the outer and inner membrane. And you can shine light on these molecules and then they'll open up and let stuff in, right? The, they, they'll let ions in, they'll let other stuff in, right? So neuroscientists had a dream. They had a dream where what if we could just like put something into the brain to make one neuron fire or to make a set of neurons fire, right? Well, how could we possibly do that? Well, these guys at Stanford, Carl Dasseroff and Ed Boyden, uh, you know, a while ago, about 10 years ago, they, um, they decided, well, these bacteria have these, these membrane molecules, or if you shine laser light on them, they'll open up and let ions in. And if you let ions in, a neuron will fire. So they said, let's try to take some of these opsins from bacteria and insert them into mice brains, right? So what they did, so they, they created these genetic hybrids where you had these opsins inserted in mice. And then they shined laser light on these mice. And lo and behold, their neurons fired. So now they've realized this dream where you can figure out what the circuit does by stimulating it, not just looking at it, but stimulating it, right? And so they can do crazy things like create these remote control mice where if you stimulate in one region, it'll go left. If you stimulate in another region, it'll go right, and, and so on. Um, yeah, okay, so, so then also you can, you can look at genetically enhanced or modified organisms as well. So you can perturb the molecular machinery of the circuit and, and see what's going on. And also we can start to look at more and more complicated behaviors. So there's this quantification of behavior, right? So on the technology side, there's a huge amount of uh, activity going on. And so the question is, once we get all this data, how the heck do we make sense of it, right? And that's where theory comes in, right? So we have to try to create integrated models of the brain that span across all these scales, right, from nanometer scales to, to tens of centimeter scales. And, and so we need theory to, to, to play a role. And different types of theory can play a role, right? So on the one hand, the physical and mathematical sciences have various uh, fields that have themselves developed powerful tools to confront complexity in, those, in, in their own fields, right? So for example, statistical mechanics and physics is, deals with how do large numbers of heterogeneous molecules or systems or degrees of freedom interact with each other and what kind of emergent properties arise. You know, there's fields like pattern formation, uh, stochastic processes, dynamical systems theory. How do large complicated dynamical systems behave, right? So we need to, to use, exploit all of these fields to try to understand all of this data. But um, neural systems aren't simply just tangled webs of complexity that exist for their own sake, right? They're not just physical systems. They've been evolved over millions and millions of years of evolution to solve interesting functions or to do interesting computations that right now our best computers can't even do, right? So for example, I could, I could pick this up, open, open, the, open the lid and drink from it pretty quickly without hopefully spilling any water on myself most of the time. Uh, and robots can't do that. They, they just, no robots are dexterous enough to do that, right? Um, so, so we can do all these amazing feats. So it's useful to also turn to the engineering sciences to think about what exactly are the computations that neural systems are solving, right? And in the history of artificial intelligence, we got this terribly wrong in the past, right? A, a long time ago, people thought that playing chess was the hard problem, right? Like humans do these amazing things like playing chess, playing gap, backgammon and all that stuff. And then they, they thought that's where AI is, the future of AI lies. Let's, let's get a, um, a, a, a computer to do that. And we succeeded, right? We have chess playing computers that are much better than humans. Uh, Gary pa Kasparov lost to a computer not too long ago in chess. Uh, but those chess playing systems operate using principles that are very different from our brain. They can do very, very deep look ahead, right? Uh, an almost brute force search with some interesting pruning procedures to avoid bad chess configurations. And that's how they beat the human. The human uses this ethereal, elusive intuition that we don't really have a way to understand, right? 
but where humans still kick computers' butts is just the basic things like motor control, object recognition, vision, right? I can just look at a scene and tell, tell you, all of you can look at a scene and say what's going on in this scene, right? Computers can't do that yet. They're getting better at it. And, and there's this new field of machine learning, statistical machine learning slash neural networks that's starting to get better at, at some basic tasks. So it, it's useful to try to figure out what are the interesting computations that neural systems are doing and, you know, try to unify physics, mathematics, engineering, and computation with experimental neurobiology. And that's created this new field of theoretical neuroscience. And there's actually a lot of physicists populating this field. It, it, it's, it's because the, the skills that physicists have are very, very useful, uh, as you can see, um, in, in trying to make sense of all of this stuff. So, um, okay, so what kind of stuff do we study? All right, so this is the New York Times view of the brain. Right, it's wrong in every possible way. Like geometrically, it's just wrong. All right, uh, neurons are not so symmetric. They don't send tendrils out in every single direction symmetrically like that. There, there's actually almost no space in your. There's no empty space in your brain. Your, your brain, each neuron is butt, butting up against every other neuron. Right. Uh, the, there's a huge premium on volume. Right. Um, and for good reason, actually. The, it's thought that the main evolutionary constraint. On, on brain evolution is, is the size of your brain. It can't be that big because it has to fit through the birth canal, right? And, and so there's a strong constraint there. So, so evolution solved that by making the brain denser and denser without making it bigger and bigger, probably, right? So, but but this, it did get one thing right. So what these neurons do is they send electrical signals to each other. When an electrical signal goes from one neuron to another, it gets converted temporarily into a chemical signal and that chemical signal transduces electrical signals from one neuron to another neuron. And this is called the synapse. It's, it's the chemical device that connects one neuron's electrical impulses and makes the other neuron's electrical impulses fire. Some are excitatory, so that if this neuron fires, it'll cause this neuron to fire. Some are inhibitory, where the opposite happens. If this neuron fires, this one will be inhibited. So you have this huge interconnected network in all of your brains. You have 10 to the 11th neurons, about 100 billion neurons, and you have 10 to the 14th synapses, about, about ten, uh, tentral and synapses, right? Now, out of this huge network where electrical activity is flying out, and the, oh, the, the most important thing about synapses is that their strength can change, right? So it's thought that our very ability to learn and remember depends on our ability to rewire our brain by changing the strength of our synapses in response to our experiences. And so if you change the strength of these synapses, you essentially create a new circuit that new circuit allows you to respond to new stimuli in ways that you didn't before. And that's essentially the hallmark of learning. Right? So it's this amazing system, right? And out of this biological wetware, all of your higher functions arise as emergent properties, right? Your ability to perceive, your ability to pay attention, your ability to do decision making, your ability to form categories about the external world, your ability to control your motor system, your ability to learn and remember, all of these emerge from this strange biological wetware, right? We actually, in our lab, uh, you know, over the course of my time working on the subject, we have results on all of these, all of these uh, um, areas, actually. Now, there's even more amazing things that we do, right? We have consciousness, we have emotion, we have logic, we can do mathematics, we can do physics. Uh, I have nothing to say about this. Not many people do. It's, it's, it's very difficult to understand how some of these things emerge from this biological wetware. Although, well, okay, so fear is something that people have worked out. Uh, and consciousness is, um, people are starting to work on that. But, uh, and actually there's some work on mathematics as well. But, but I, I tend to stay closer to the things that are much more well-defined, uh, uh, at least from a psychological perspective. So the overarching question we attack in our lab is how do these higher level behavioral and cognitive phenomena arise as emergent properties of neural circuits, right? That, that's the, the key question that, that animates us. So I'll, I'll give you like a summary of various projects that we're thinking about in our lab. Each one of these projects could be sort of a one hour talk on its own. But, but uh, again, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a tour. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll spend more time on this slide than I usually do. So, um, so part of my job involves collaborating with experimentalists. So I'm a theorist. I don't do experiments myself. I would be incompetent at doing them. I, I'm no good at them. Um, it, I've never actually tried to do them, but I'm so confident I'm not good at them that I've definitely not tried. 
But fortunately, I have collaborators who are extremely good at them, right? So these are various labs at Stanford that I'm talking to, and we, you know, we talk and we try to figure out stuff together. And so these are some of the things that we figured out, okay? So, for example, the first step in, in perception is really vision, okay? Or, or, or the retina, right? So everything goes to your retina. So what is your retina? Your retina is actually a very complicated circuit, all right? So you have photoreceptors, that's the first stage, okay? And what these photoreceptors do is photons will, will come and they'll, uh, photons will fall onto the photoreceptors and they'll be absorbed uh, by, by a molecule called rhodopsin. It's actually quite amazing, but through various experiments, they've been able to show that um, a, single, a, single photo, a single photoreceptor neuron right, in, your, in your brain is powerful enough to absorb a single photon. Okay? They've, they've done experiments where they shine very, very dim flashes to, the, uh, to a subject in a dark room, and they make the flash dimmer and dimmer until the person can no longer see it see the flash. So the point at which they can just see it, they actually can compute that in that flash there are only about five or six photons that fell on your retina. Now the chance that these five or six photons fell onto the same photoreceptor in your retina is infinitesimally small. They're probably spread out across many photoreceptors. So that means each individual photoreceptor only gets one photon and so therefore it must detect it. And then the downstream circuitry sums the signal and thresholds it to see it. So, so that's the first stage. Is it's a quantum mechanical step where a single photon is absorbed by a single molecule. So it's amazing that quantum mechanics is the beginning of perception, right? Uh, but then it becomes more classical, All right? So then what happens is you have uh, retinal ganglion cells, right? That this is the bottleneck, right? Everything you know about the external world, at least from your sense of vision arises from patterns of electrical activity in about one million retinal ganglion cells. So you have, you have the optic nerve from each, each of your eyes. Each optic nerve from one eye has about one million uh, uh, retinal, actually I think, sorry, it's from both eyes. The total, total optic nerve is about one, one million neurons, right? So that's it, that, that's everything you know about the brain just in one million wires, uh, sorry, everything you know about vision in one million wires. Now, the, the circuitry is actually a very complicated circuitry. The retina is quite smart, actually. So intervening between the photoreceptors and the ganglion cells are these hidden neurons, so-called bipolar cells and amacrine cells, right? And what experimentalists do is they shine light on the foot. They, they actually take the retina out of an animal, they place it on a dish, and they shine light from the top and record the ganglion cells from the bottom. It's a pretty amazing setup. They've been doing that since about uh, you know, the year 2000 or so. Um, so, so what they can do is they can shine light here and record from here. They record the electrical signals coming out. So we can start to ascertain the input-output map that the retina performs. But what we can't do, what we don't often do is we don't reconstruct from these neurons in the interior. So what we were able to contribute was we were able to come up with computational algorithms to essentially reconstruct what's going on in the interior of the circuit without having to record from the interior of the circuit. So we were able to infer just from the patterns, of the patterns of photoreceptor activity and the patterns of ganglion cell activation what was going on in the interior. And then when people record from the interior, they, f they find cells whose response properties look a lot like what we computationally inferred. Right? So, so basically, here's a situation where computation can in some sense replace observational experiment, which is kind of nice, because it's so hard to record from these neurons. Okay, um, okay so one of the other things that we've done is uh, on the side of vision is, is the a fly motion detection, all right? So you've all tried to swat a fly at some point or another, admit it. I mean, I have too. Uh, they're really hard to get. Those flies will fly away really quickly, all right? The reason is they're like one of the world's most premier animal models of motion detection. They can detect all sorts of interesting motion patterns occurring on their eyes, okay? All right, and uh, so their eyes have a very different structure from our eyes. By the way, this, these retinas that we look at are in salamanders and rabbits and so on. Uh, these eyes are very different from, from, from the, the eyes that we have. But it turns out their algorithm for motion detection is exactly the same. That's what our work showed. 
So basically, so in a collaboration with the Clendenin Lab at Stanford, so what can they do? They can, um, so it's very hard to record from inside the eye, inside the fly's eye, while the, eye, while the fly is alive, all right? So what they can do is the following. So they can do that calcium imaging that I mentioned before, right? What, what they can do is they can, um, they can stick a, a calcium imaging device. So what, what they do is they, uh, you know, so, so to image, the, so okay, so what do they do? They tag a bunch of neurons in the fly's brain with this uh, fluorescence indicator. So they can genetically target so you know, e each neuron in the fly's brain has a unique genetic identity, right? So if you want to record from the types of neurons in the fly's brain that detect motion, you can do that because you know the genetic identity of that cell in terms of specific patterns of DNA that that cell expresses, right? And so you can take these fluorescence indicator molecules and, and, and attach to them another piece of DNA, right? That essentially targets them or set, sends them to, to those cells. I mean, it actually causes expression in those cells, but anyway, that's a technical detail. But basically, at the end of the day, you can make a specific subset of cells fluorescent, right? So that when you shine laser light on them, or when they're activated, they'll emit a fluorescent, uh, 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 fluorescence that you can then collect. So they essentially, they can create this amazing miniature microscope that sits on the top of the fly's brain and it sends in and out light, right? And then they show all sorts of moving stimuli to the fly, right? And then it's kind of, they can even do this in like tethered things where the fly is tethered to a string and it can move back and forth. So if, if you make the world move to the right, the fly will move to the right to try to stabilize its, its, its flight pattern, right? That's really important, right? Because if a fly is trying to get to some distant target, Right? If it's off and it moves this way, the world will move this way relative to its eyes, so it'll try to come back and correct it. So we see that, if they see that effect in the lab. But in any case, to make a long story short, they showed all sorts of rich motion stimuli to the fly, and then we recorded from the fly's neurons. So now we have two pieces of data. We have the visual activity that the fly is seeing and the activity of the neurons that detect motion. Right. So then again, we can use theory and computation to come up, to, to intuit the input-output algorithm that the fly's visual circuitry is doing to detect motion. Okay? And there were debates about what the algorithm might be. People had different ideas. People thought that humans and, and, and mammals did it one way and flies did it another way. And, and because nobody had shown a rich set of stimuli to the fly, nobody really knew for sure what the fly did. And because nobody applied theory and computation to a rich set of stimuli, it wasn't clear what the fly did. So we, we figured it out, and it turned out they do it exactly the same way that humans do. Right? So it's, it's kind of amazing. So here you have these two organisms that are very, very far separated uh, evolutionarily. But it turns out in these two branches of evolution, in the fly branch and the, and the human branch, both visual systems settled on the same solution. So that's an example of convergent evolution, where if there's a good idea, and it turns out the algorithm that the fly uses is a good idea, it's an optimal algorithm in some sense, uh, if there's a good solution, then, the, then evolution will find it more than once. Okay? So kind of evolution completely decided to go a different way as far as the photoreceptors go in the eye, in the fly, but the algorithm is the same from going from photoreceptors to motion selectivity. Okay, so... In, in the Giacomo lab uh, at Stanford, uh, so do you guys, have you guys heard of grid cells by any chance? So these are these amazing cells that like nobody ordered, but they happen to be there. And they were actually the subject of the most recent Nobel Prize in, in, in physiology. So the Mosers, the, there's, this is a, um, a husband and wife team in Norway, they discovered these grid cells and also John O'Keefe discovered these place cells. And Lisa Giacomo trained with them, and then she came to Stanford, lucky for us. And so we, we worked with her. So what are these grid cells? Okay, so these grid cells are um, cells in the rat's hippocampus, okay? Um, how many of you heard of hippocampus? Probably, probably not. Okay, oh, that's amazing, yeah. So, so the, the hippocampus became famous because it's thought to be the site where we first store our memories. How did they know that? There was this famous patient called HM, all right? And it turned out that, um, you know, they were trying to treat his brain and they screwed up and they, and they, uh, 
accidentally took out his hippocampus, right? Actually, we only learned recently what they actually took out because he, he recently passed away, so we could actually dissect his brain and figure out what was actually taken out. But in any case, they took out a bunch of his hippocampus and some other parts of his brain. But this led to a remarkable deficit. He was completely logical. He, he was a smart guy, you could talk to him and all that stuff. He would just forget everything within five minutes, right? So you could have a conversation with him and you couldn't tell there was anything wrong with him. Then you'd leave the room, right? And a few minutes later come back and he'd introduce himself to you as if he'd never met you before, right? Yet his ability to remember what he did in his childhood and so on and so forth, completely fine. So, and, and all of his knowledge about current events before the time of that surgery that screwed him up, completely fine, right? So we know a lot more now about what's going on. So what, what, pattern, what explains that pattern of deficit? What explains it is that there's a part of your brain, the hippocampus, that's responsible for rapidly storing your recent memories, right? And then over time, those memories are transferred to your cortex, the, the top part of your brain, so that, you're, so, so that memories that you formed a long time ago are no longer um, depend on the intactness of your hippocampus, right? So we have this kind of two-tiered memory system, a fast, rapid one, and a slow, but like much more expansive one, right? It's kind of like RAM and ROM and some, I mean, RAM and, and, and hard drives, right? But, um, so the other interesting thing about the hippocampus is it seems to be involved in navigation as well, okay? We don't, we don't know that for sure, but we do know that there are cells that are very strongly correlated with navigation. So in the hippocampus, if you can make a rat sort of move around on a, by the way, I'm only in my second slide and I have about 30 slides, but I hope this is entertaining. Uh, actually, I have like 60 slides, but I, I wasn't expecting to get through. But uh, is, this is this kind of the level you want? Okay, yeah, so there's math that we can do too, but uh, anyways, uh, but, but, um, but th this is amazing because this is a, this is a Nobel Prize winning uh, thing, okay. But before these cells, all right, so, okay, so what, what is this? So this is, the, this is a square enclosure that a rat has been moving around in, all right? And, you know, in the 1970s and 80s, people were really excited about place cells in the hippocampus. So these black curves are the trajectories of the rat, so the rat has explored this space quite a bit. And there were special cells called place cells in the hippocampus that fired if and only if the rat was in a specific location, right? So like, for example, there might be a place cell here where if the rat was here, it fires here and nowhere else, right? There might be a place cell here, another one here. And so at any given time, when the rat is in a particular point in space, there's a population of cells that are firing. Those cells whose place fields are at that position in place, by definition, all right? So more recently, about 10 years ago again, what they found was one synapse upstream, like, or, or you know, a couple of synapses upstream, they found another brain region that had something even more remarkable, which was grid cells. These are cells that fire if and only if the rat is at the vertices of a hexagonal grid. Okay? So th this is a, so, so okay, so, so now what you're seeing, so now I can finally explain this, you're seeing red dots overlaid on the black traces of where the rat has been. And the red dots are precisely placed whenever the cell, this one cell that they recorded from, uh, whenever that cell fires, right? So as you can see, the cell fires, if and only if the rat is here, 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 or you know, at all of these places. And remarkably, all of these places form a hexagonal grid pattern, okay? And there's more cells like this. It's not, there's not just one cell in the brain that's like this, right? So, so this is kind of remarkable, all right? And uh, it was so remarkable they got a Nobel Prize for this, uh, which is well-deserved. But we still don't fully understand two things, okay? We don't understand what it's good for. We don't, we don't understand what the function of the system is. And two, we don't understand how it arises, okay? Like what kind of neural circuit could give rise to this? We have some hypotheses. We don't know for sure if those hypotheses are true. But one of the hypotheses has something interesting to do with pat Turing pattern formation. So. Uh, Pattern formation is a, is a subject that's at the intersection of mathematics and physics and, and all that. It's all about how patterns form in, uh, in real life, right? So here's a remarkable fact. Let's say that you have 
sort of a, a two-dimensional plane of sources, right? Some emitters or something. And each source excites itself, right? But inhibits its neighbors, okay? So, so it's like a winner-take-all kind of competitive system where you have local excitation. Well, it excites itself and excites its neighbors, but neighbors further away it inhibits, right? And let's say it's sort of circularly symmetric, right? So then what will be the density, and, and let's say the activation is, say, the concentration of a chemical, right? So what will the density of that concentration be at steady state? It'll turn out to be exactly a hexagonal grid like this, right? So, oh uh, yeah, go ahead. What does it look like in 3D? Oh, that's an excellent question, okay. So, um, can you repeat the question? Yeah, oh yeah, the question was, what does it, this look like in 3D, right? So the rat is moving around in 2D, okay? All right, this is a fantastic question. What does it look like in 3D? So you have to get an animal to move in 3D. Right? Now this is how gutsy exper experimental neuroscientists are. I have so much respect for them. What animal would you look at that moves in 3D? Uh, uh, bird, bird. Yeah, a bird, a bird is a good one. Bat is an even better one. Uh, why? Because birds are evolutionarily more separated than us. Right? They're, 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 they're more distant from us and their hippocampus might behave differently from, from mammalian hippocampus. But a bat is a mammal that flies, all right? So Nahum Ulanovsky at, uh, 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 in Israel, um, uh, he has recorded from bats while they're flying in three-dimensional space, all right? And uh, the first thing, we, like, we don't actually know what the flight patterns of bats are. So these Israeli bats, I don't know if they're any different from American bats, but, but um, what they do is they live in these caves, and he just put these um, tracking devices on the bat so, so that the device could, could relay back exactly in physical space where the rat was at any given time. And he has these amazing, like he's, he superimposed the um, bat's flying patterns on Google Earth, right? And what these bats do is they leave their cave, and they'll fly in a straight line to some tree that has lots of food, uh, maybe two miles away, and they just fly in a straight line, all right? So that's bad because now it's kind of starts flying in a one-dimensional, you know, line. So it's hard to know what these cells in the bat's hippocampus would do in three dimensions. So then they also did it in a, a in a much smaller enclosure, and they put sprinkled food all over the enclosure, so the bat would fly all over the place. And they're just getting that data now. And I actually teach at Woods Hole, which is a marine biological institute in in the East Coast. So so I got to saw this data because one of his students came to Woods Hole. And uh, this is unpublished data, actually. So, so not many other people have seen the data. But it's amazing. It's not quite grids in three dimensions. It actually looks much more random. You get these blobs in a firing where, you know, if this is three-dimensional space, there'll be kind of random blobs in physical space where any one neuron will fire. And so now it, it may be the case that in three dimensions, it's better to be random than it is to be a grid. And, and so... You know, information theorists and you know, theoretical neuroscientists are using information theory to try to work out what an optimal placement of grids might be to maximize information about physical position and so on. But uh, I think this is a story that will get written over the next few years that we'll, we'll start to understand more about what these systems are doing. But what did we do here, right? So, so how is it that a system could, could, um, could achieve this, right? Well, one idea is that, that the rat may be doing path integration, right? So you all have this experience where you, you kind of walk a few city blocks and you haven't really been paying, visually to, paying visual attention to where you've been going. But you kind of remember the path you took so that you could backtrack, right? So what you've been doing is you've been integrating your velocity to get position, right? And, and so it may be the case that these cells are doing this. So what we did was, well, that's one possibility. The other possibility is that the rat is continuously using landmarks to figure out where it is in space and correcting its internal estimate of position uh, based on landmarks. So there's sort of two ways to know uh, how you got to where you are. You integrate your previous history or you look at where you are, right? So what we showed is we, we, did, we did some analysis. So, so Lisa had all of this data in her lab and we had a joint student. And so we did all this analysis to try to figure out, um, well, which of these two possibilities is it? And so we were able to show using some very simple analysis that it was actually using landmarks, not integrating. It was a little bit of both, yeah? Do 
Yeah, so bats use echolocation, right? They're, they're always using echolocation to fi find stuff. They're kind of, you know, the phrase blind as a bat, right? It, it's actually kind of true. Uh, by the way, you know the phrase dimmer than a light bulb, right? <laughs> That's actually true. So a light bulb, a typical light bulb has, uh, spends about 100 watts, right? That's how much energy, uh, I'm going in a tangent, but anyway, a light bulb uh, spends about 100 watts to, to create light. How many watts do you think your brain spends? Okay, somebody knew the answer, yeah. It's, it's right, 20 watts, right? So we're all literally dimmer than the light bulb. It's actually quite amazing, right, that we're so energy efficient. That's another huge conceptual puzzle that I think physicists need to think about, right? How is it that we can be so energy efficient, whereas our best supercomputers that train all these big neural networks are definitely spending much more energy than just one light bulb, let alone a fifth of a light bulb, right? Anyways, okay, but sorry, what was your question? Echolocation, yeah, so bats use it. Right. Um, okay, so, so what we showed was actually what the rat does is it corrects its internal estimate of position every time it hits a border. Okay? So it turns out there's another set of cells called, called border cells that fire if and only if the rat is at one border or, or another cell will fire if it's here, another cell will fire if it's here, and so on. Right? So what we can show is that if you look at this data and just track where the individual spikes are, the, 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 where, where, at which points in space the neuron fires, um, the rat will, the, the spikes tend to occur further and further from these centers the longer the rat has been from a border. We did this both in rats and mice. Both the rats and, for both the rats and mice, the longer since it's been at a border, the more error prone its, its spikes get. Okay? So that suggests that rats are correcting uh, every time it gets to a border, correcting its internal estimate of position. Now, if you just think, you know, if a rat hits one of these borders, right, it only gets to, it, it only knows where it is along a direction perpendicular to the border, but not parallel to the border, right? So, so it cannot correct its position parallel to the border, but it can correct its component of position perpendicular to the border. So this makes a prediction, a theoretical prediction. And we tested it, and remarkably, it turned out to be true. Every time the rat hits, hits a border, the spikes get corrected perpendicular, but not parallel to the border. And there's all sorts of other analyses that we could do to show that, this, that there was this sort of error correction system going on in the rat's brain. So anyways, that's, that's one thing. Um, okay, so the other thing, so from the Chinoy lab at Stanford, so the Chinoy lab, they do... Um, uh, 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 they study reaching movements, right? So what they do is they actually now, so we're moving up the evolutionary chain, now we're going to monkeys. So what they do is they record from monkeys, and monkeys have very dexterous reaching movements, right? And so it's, it's kind of actually amazing. We can record from like 100 neurons in the monkey's brain, right? The Schnoy lab records from 100 neurons in the monkey's brain. And from that, we can actually decode how the monkey's reaching. We can decode the position, velocity, and acceleration of the arm. Now, the motor cortex has, you know, order of magnitude, 50 million neurons, right? So how the heck did we get so lucky? How is it that we can stick a hundred, record from 100 neurons and decode, you know, aspects of the monkey's behavior, uh, despite the fact that there's many, many more neurons in the brain that we're not recording from? And it's actually even more amazing, they also work in brain-machine interfaces. So what they can do is, once you build a decoder that goes from the monkey's brain to an estimate of the, mon the monkey's position and velocity of the arm, they can then tie the arm of the monkey behind its back, right? And then use the decoder to control a cursor, right? So now what, so, so basically, the, the monkey is responsible for moving a cursor to get a reward somewhere on the screen. And it can't move the cursor by moving a joystick, right, to move the cursor or, or reaching directly to the reward. It has to use its brain to, um, to move the cursor because the only way the monkey can move, move the cursor is by changing activity in its brain, having that activity be read out by the decoder that was previously trained to decode arm position while the monkey was moving a joystick to move the original cursor. But then that, the output of the decoder is directly used to drive the, the cursor, right? So the monkey just has to think and move the cursor and he can do it, right? 
It's actually quite amazing. And now they're doing this on humans. So they're taking humans that are paralyzed and they've actually got a setup where the human can move a cursor on the screen to say type just by thinking. Right? So one of the big conceptual puzzles, and we, you know, we worked more on the conceptual side here, is conceptually how is it that we can record from such a small number of neurons? Um, this is a bit more technical, but what we showed is that the, the act of recording from a random subset of neurons in the brain is like recording from random linear combinations of all neurons in the brain. Okay? And therefore, we connected the theory of neural measurement to this new theory called random projection theory, relatively new theory in mathematics called random projection theory, that tells us how, as a function of the complexity of the task, how many, and the smoothness of neural dynamics, how many neurons we, we need to record to accurately decode behavior. And we found that because the tasks are relatively simple, just moving your arm in a two-dimensional plane, it turns out you don't actually need that many neurons as long as neural activity patterns are distributed across a set of neurons that you're recording from. And it turns out 100 is actually the right answer. Right? Um, but as we start to do more and more complicated tasks, we'll need more neurons. And the theory can tell us the theory can tell us how many more neurons we'll need. Okay? So it's kind of a predictive theory of experimental design, right? We're kind of going into terra incognita, right? We're recording in complicated parts of an animal's brain, and we have no clue what to look for. We have no clue how many neurons we need to record. But that's where theory can play a role. It can lead to a rational theory of experimental design that tells you, given the complexity of the task and the smoothness of neural dynamics, how many neurons should I record, right? So that's one thing. Okay, so now this is the other, okay, so this is, you know, we have to talk about mutants at some point, right? So, so this is the work on mutants that, that, that we're doing. So we're collaborating with the Raymond lab and actually also Carla Schatz's lab, okay? So this is kind of an interesting story, all right? So I told you before that our very ability to learn and remember depends on our ability to um, modify synapses in our brain, right? So the idea is like, you know, you're at this talk, Hopefully you remember some of the things I said. Somebody will ask you, you know, you went to a talk today, what did you learn? And you'll be able to say stuff that you wouldn't have been able to say if you hadn't been at the talk, right? So what changed in your brain between the beginning and end of this talk? You actually created new circuits in your brain. You really did. Like there are new circuits in your hippocampus that weren't there before, right? And that will allow you to answer questions uh, that you wouldn't have been able to answer before. Right? So we're changing these circuits, right? And, and one, of the, one of the ideas behind plasticity is sort of neurons that fire together, wire together, right? So if you sort of see somebody's face and you see some, and you hear their name, right? A pattern of uh, uh, neurons will activate in your brain associated with the face. A pattern of neurons will activate in your brain associated with the, the name. And then they'll fire at the same time and hopefully some of them will be connected to each other. So those connections will become stronger Right? And then you've created a new circuit that connects the face to the name and the name to the face. Right? And it's that new circuit that enables you to see, say that person's name when you see their face and also recall their face when you hear their name. Right? So that's a very simple um, example of what's called associative learning. You learn to associate a face with a name. All the more complicated learning that we do is thought to arise also from these kinds of local plasticity mechanism. So your ability to change a synapse is called plasticity. And, and so, yeah, you've changed the strength of these synapses, all right? Okay, so you might think that if you want to become smarter, we should try to enhance our, the plasticity of our synapses, right? We should try to make it easier for them to change, right? It's a reasonable hypothesis. Maybe we could create a class of superhumans that have very, very plastic synapses, synapses that change very, very easily, all right? This sounds like science fiction, but people have done this in mice um, because mice are very tractable genetically. All right, so, but <laughs> it doesn't always work out the way you think it is. So people have done all sorts of various, various um, pharmacological and genetic modifications to synapses to make them more jumpy, to make them more plastic, to make them more easily change, all right? And sometimes the animal gets smarter, right? They, they put the mice through various exercises and they ask how long does it take them to solve each exercise. These are like finding mazes uh, or, or navigating through mazes and stuff like that. And sometimes they get dumber, i.e. they get slower. And sometimes they get smarter, i.e. they get faster, right? 
So this is problematic, right? We want to guarantee if we do this, uh, I mean, we're, never, we're probably never going to do this in humans unless we get a drug that can do this without actually genetically modifying humans. But in any case, uh, this is a problem, right? That we want to guarantee that we'll get smarter, yeah? Are there no synapses developed at all? That would be like a tremendous problem. I mean, the animal would die, right? I mean, if that happened. Um, oh, I see. Actually, the brain kind of does the opposite. It actually, it, it overgenerates synapses, right? And then it prunes them. So, so babies will generate many, many more synapses than, than they need. And then eventually they'll get selected away. It's as if only the most important synapses remain, right? In fact, it's a kind of actually interesting. I don't know if you guys have followed this craze on, on uh, deep learning, right? Th these deep neural networks that are capable of solving complicated tasks. It turns out there's two ways to make these networks work. One, you make them small so they don't overfit to, to the training data set that they're trying to mimic. Or two, you make them very, very big, but you prune them. You, you somehow try to kill all the synapses. It turns out the latter works better, right? So it's always kind of nice when something that you observe in biology turns out to be a good engineering trick to get artificial neural networks to work, right? So, so it's kind of consistent there. Um, actually, yeah, you guys should feel free to totally ask questions. We, we definitely don't need to get through all my slides. I'm happy to just, yeah. Oh, we're not going to anyways. Um, okay, yeah, so, so here, right? So in the Raymond lab, what they were able to do is they were able to, so, so okay, so Carla Schatz can, can um, modify neurons in the, in the um, uh, sorry, modify synapses in the, uh, in the mouse's brain that makes a particular type of plasticity uh, easier, right? So what is that type of plasticity? It's plasticity in the circuit that stabilizes your, your eyes, right? So, so for example, if I do an experiment on you where I, I uh, so you should fixate on the, on this, on, on the tip of this uh, laser pointer, right? And move your head uh, that way than this way, right? So, yeah. Okay, so automatically your eyes moved in the opposite direction of your head, right? In order to make sure that you fixated on this thing. Okay, all right. Now, as we age, as we get older, our eye muscles change or the environment might change. We, we need to kind of adapt this reflex, right? And in fact, I'm going to adapt it for you right now. So, so let's do the, repeat the same thing, where you move your head to the left and then move it to the right on the count of three, right? So one, two, three, right? Okay. <laughs> So you didn't maintain fixation because you didn't know I was going to go the opposite direction, right? Now, if I do this to you over and over and over again, your, your reflex, your reflex, it's called the vestibular ocular motor reflex, your vestibular system signals that your, eye, your head is moving that way, and it sends a signal to your eyes to make it move the opposite way to maintain fixation. If I do this kind of weird thing where I alter the external world, that reflex will automatically change to increase the eye movement to maintain fixation, right? And we can do it the other way, right? If I, if, so on the count of three, one, two, three, move your head this way and then that way, right? So one, two, three, right? So now I moved it in concert with your eyes and then you need to reduce this reflex, right? Because if your head moves that way, your eyes don't need to move in the opposite direction to maintain fixation, okay? So this is called the VOR reflex. We do it, mice do it. All animals, all mammals do it, okay? So you can ask how quickly do they learn this reflex, right? So what they did was they um, enhanced the plasticity of this reflex. So it turns out that there's a loop. Oh, it's right here, actually. This is the circuit that implements this reflex. This is nice because we just did the experiment. So now you can learn what was going on in your brain, okay? So this is the vestibular system. So you have ear canals that have mo uh, liquid in them. They move when you move your head. That motion creates electrical signals that tell your brain that your head is moving, okay? So those electrical signals come in here. And this is the vestibular nucleus, and it connects directly to the eye. And so this is the baseline circuitry that allows you to maintain fixation, okay? But you have this adaptive side loop 
that can modify the gain of this pathway, right? And these synapses are plastic, right? And let's say your eye moves, but you don't maintain fixation, then there'll be some object that's slipping on your retina, right? That slippage in your retina will send up, send up an, um, an error signal through your inferior olive. It'll say, holy crap, something's moving in your retina that it wasn't supposed to. That'll change the strength of these synapses, and that will change the side loop, and that will modify the strength of this direct pathway. Right? That, that was what was going on in your brain. Right? What well, would have been going on if we had done this experiment longer. Okay, so what they did was they made these synapses much more plastic. They, they were able to be much, much more um, uh, plastic. And it turns out the mice got dumber at this task. All right? It took them much longer to adapt their vestibulocular motor reflex when the, the object moved. Okay, so... Um, and then we came up with like sort of a theory why, right? So basically the idea is it, it, if you make all the synapses more plastic, there's spontaneous activity in the circuit, right? And then all the synapses will become, become um, weak, it turns out. And that's actually really bad for you. So your ability to learn and remember depends on a delicate interplay between plasticity in your synapses and spontaneous activity in your brain. And you have to get that interplay right. So that, that's, that was sort of one of the insights that we had. Okay, so, um, so now we're on the one, two, three, fourth slide. Okay, so. Dr. Yeah. I, 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 other people might have other interests, but I'd like yeah. to see a sense of, of your, your uh, you know, your, your in, in computational and theoretical. Yeah. So, uh, and this looks like the beginning of a set of tools, but we right. have 10 minutes remaining. Sure. So, so the idea of the, the tools, um, maybe uh, the theoretical the tools. Theoretical yeah, yeah. tools. Okay, so let's how jump. How do you interact with those? Yeah, oh, by the, that, that, yeah this right. is my, <laughs> this is the project that really keeps me up at night. I have a five month old, and, and last night I was up at two in the morning, four in the morning, five in the morning, and six in the morning, and, and seven in the morning. So I'm a little bit zonked, but anyways, uh, so let let's actually um, talk about a specific research project. Okay. So let's talk about this mathematical theory of semantic development. So this is work that I did with the psychologist, Jay McClelland uh, at Stanford. And this is uh, Andrew Sachs, a, a very good graduate student, who's now a, a, a postdoc at MIT. Um, and so you know, when I first got to Stanford, I was thinking about, you know, I, I, was think, I, I wanted to learn about psychology, so I wandered around in the psychology department. And, and this, this, talk could, this part of the talk could usually be called sort of the misadventures of an applied physicist wandering around the psychology department. So, actually, do I want to do this or do I want to do, let, let me first do another one that's more fun and then we can come back to this one if there's time. So one of the things that we've worked on also is recurrent neural networks, right? So actually, let me go to that. So I'll just flip through all the stuff that we're not covering. Um, <laughs> okay, so I, I wasn't actually planning on covering all of this, but uh, just all the slides were here. Okay. So okay, so one of them is is okay. So one of the things we have to do in is data analysis, right? And, and when we're doing data analysis, we sometimes have to learn probabilistic models of our data, right? So data often comes in terms of some distribution, right? You have the set of all images that you see, and so on and so forth. There's some distribution over the set of images that we'd like to learn. So data can, can be very, very complicated. And we were motivated by some recent results in non echovio physics, where you know the second law of thermodynamics, right? Which says that left to its own devices, a closed system will tend towards more and more disorder. But recent work in, in non echovio mechanics has shown that this second law can be transiently, quote unquote, violated. For short periods of time and for small systems, you can sometimes spontaneously create uh, order from noise. Right? So we were motivated these ideas by these ideas to try to come up with a new way to model complicated data distributions. And here's the basic idea. Let's say that you have a complicated data distribution, which will show schematically by this die. Right? This is a complicated probability distribution of where die is located. Right? If you were to let the die diffuse over time, right, then over time it would become a simpler distribution. Right? And if you ran this process for a long period of time, it would become uniform. All right? So 
Now, if left to its own devices, you would never see a uniform die distribution become a complicated non-uniform die distribution. That would violate the second law of thermodynamics, right? But for small systems, it can be transiently violated. And for larger systems, maybe we could help that violation in time uh, to get models of the data. So what we can do is we could try to train a neural network to reverse this process, right? So we could recover the data distribution starting from a simpler distribution by running a new type of reverse dynamics using a trained neural network, okay? So this is kind of physics-inspired machine learning, actually, right? So we want to go from a simple distribution to a complicated distribution by training a neural network to reverse time, okay? So we were actually able to do that. Um, so let me give you some examples of that. So this is a classic sort of complicated distribution in, in, in machine learning. It's called the Swiss roll. If you Google Swiss roll machine learning, you'll find a whole bunch of stuff on this. So this is kind of a complicated data distribution. It's not, it's not like a simple one, like a Gaussian blob or something, right? It, it's, it lives on some low dimensional manifold structure. It, this is a bunch of data points in a two dimensional ambient space that's concentrated on a one dimensional curve manifold, right? So, what we do is we systematically destroy structure in this data, all right? By having the data undergo a diffusion process where each data point just diffuses around, but it's connected to the origin by a spring of some spring constant, right? So you have the restoring force and then diffusion. And we know that the stationary distribution of that process is, a, is an isotropic Gaussian, right? And so I'm just gonna illustrate that. This is classic physics where you use diffusion to destroy structure. Okay, and that's what you get, right? You could literally think of this as a bunch of uh, particles in a confining quadratic potential and they're diffusing due to thermal fluctuations, right? Okay, now, if you were just to run the diffusion process forward from here, you would never see this Gaussian cloud coalesce into the Swiss roll, right? That's a violation of the second law. Um, but what we did was we, let me run this again. What we did is we gave we gave a neural network this movie, okay? So we created training data from this movie, and we had a neural network with multiple layers that were trained so that each layer would go from frame one of this, from, from one frame of this movie to the previous frame of this movie. So each layer of the neural network was trained to go one step back in time. How many of you guys have played around with neural networks or are familiar with them? So, so neural networks are just kind of artificial versions of the networks we have in our brain. There are a bunch of neurons that sum their inputs and pass them through a nonlinearity, and then you can cascade them so that you can compute very, very complicated nonlinear functions using these complicated networks. Okay, so what I said was I'm going to train these neural networks to reverse time. Now, if it works, what that means is I can feed random, uh, random Gaussian points into the neural network, right? And... Uh, and, and I should be able to turn a random Gaussian cloud as it propagates through the many layers of neural networks into the Swiss roll, right? And it actually works. So this is a different Gaussian cloud than the one from the top. And I just feed the cloud into the network and out pops a Swiss roll, right? So it's not quite perfect. There's some straggler points here. But what this, what this process of sampling a Gaussian and feeding it through the neural network does is it effectively allows me to sample from a complicated probability distribution, okay? So now we can go one step further, all right? So we can try to go to natural images. So I'll be done in like three minutes. Um, we can try to go to natural images. So natural images are much more complicated, right? Here's a toy model of natural images called the dead leaves model. So what you do is you generate a probability distribution over images in the following random fashion. You, sh you throw down circles of different radii with a power law distribution of radii to mimic the power law distribution of correlations in natural scenes. And you, um, you have occlusion and you have different colors and so on and so forth. So it looks like a bunch of leaves on the ground, right? It's a toy model, but it's a mathematically well-defined toy model of natural images, okay? So people have been trying to learn how to sample from this distribution in, in, in ways that are uh, you know, in different, using you know, different generative methods. And this is, so this is one sample from the true model. This is the next best machine learning model out there. You can see that it kind of mimics this, but not quite, okay? 
So then what we did was we did the same exact idea, right? Train neural networks to reverse time. We started with a whole bunch of um, natural Im dead leaves images, and we just had the pixels undergo diffusion. So that will take a dead leaves image and turn it into white noise, right? So now, can we have neural networks effectively learn the dead leaves model by starting from white noise and feeding, through a, feeding them into a neural network was tr that was trained to reverse the, f the flow of time? So if it works, I could, should be able to turn white noise into dead leaves, right? And this is what happens. So it gets, it gets sort of another approximation that's better than the previous one. In fact, this turns out to be the best, this turns out to be the best um, method currently in the world to do this. So what it does is it gets a, s striking things that are hard to get simultaneously. It gets sharp edges, right? It gets long range correlations in the angle of the edge, and it gets large regions of uniform contrast. So then the next thing you can try to do is you can try to sample from the posterior distribution, right, instead of a prior. And so, but, but to make a long story short, can we use this for something, right, um, other than sampling from complicated data distributions? Well, the basic idea is, for, for example, we trained this on uh, natural textures, like bark textures. So again, we took a bunch of images of bark, turned them into white noise, right? Then we took a new bark image that, that the network has never seen before, and we replaced the interior with white noise, and we clamped the pixels out here, right? And then we, you know, we took these neural networks that were trained to reverse the flow of time and fed the neural network this image, right? So the neural network is not allowed to do anything to the outside, but it can change the pixels on the inside. So then information from the exterior should propagate into the interior and fill in the bark, like denoise the system, right? And uh, this is what happens. Let me make this a little bit bigger. So, uh, how do I get rid of it? Okay, great. So, w watch the square in the middle. Right, so the neural network fills in its best guess for what was in the interior based on other examples that it saw. Um, and so, as you can see, it gets this long-range edges here, but it's not perfect, right? But, uh, but it works pretty well. So in any case, uh, we didn't really touch on this much in this talk, but there's a huge alliance now between neuroscience and machine learning, and, and we work at the intersection of those two things. We try to use ideas from physics and neuroscience to come up with better machine learning algorithms, and we try to understand what machine learning algorithms are hard to try to understand what it is the brain is doing. So there's a lot of... Um, a lot of interplay there. So let me, um, let me now end uh, So with acknowledgement. So this was work done by, I mean, I didn't talk about all this work, but, but uh, actually all the stuff I would have talked about is actually published. So you can find all of this work here. And I'd like to thank, of course, my funding sources. And yeah, thanks for, for coming. We have the room to 5.15. I know some people need to leave around 5, so let's um, have a 90-second break for those of you who need to leave. Leave the room quickly and quietly, and we'll continue with questions, okay? begin with some questions now. Yes, John, in the front. Uh, I'm getting old, 77. Uh -huh. What do you recommend to counter the effects of age on the brain? Uh, that's a good one. Men mental exercise. Right? Th there's, um, okay. So there are... So, so I'm not a medical doctor, so <laughs> just take everything I say with a grain of salt. But there are... Um, there are uh, companies out there that are working on, you know, trying to keep people's brains young by generating exercises for them. There's actually kind of a growth industry where there's a bunch of companies that say they use neuroscience to develop inspired exercises that rejuvenate the brain. I don't know if it's all hype or if it's useful or not, but, but I think it's generally a good idea. I, I think Lumosity is one of them. Uh, 
and uh, it's just a good idea just to keep thinking, right? And just just uh, yeah, exercise and 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 just thinking, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. So I don't have anything better for you than that. <laughs> I, I don't think the field really knows, right? What causes aging? We have no idea. I mean, well, the patterns. Uh -huh. uh, I'm driving in traffic, particularly yeah. at night, to sense all of the inputs and to put them together into a coherent response to stop, to go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so at attention may like the ability to attend and filter in relevant information and filter out irrelevant information may be difficult to do uh, as you get older. I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I'm getting older, right? And I, I feel like it's harder for me to concentrate for long periods of time, uh, especially when I'm sleep deprived. But I don't know if it's sleep deprivation or getting older. You have to, uh, but, but yeah, the, actually I've worked on attention and it turns out there's attentional maps in your brain. So you can pay attention to different points in space and associated with each point in space, there's a different set of neurons in your parietal cortex, such that if those neurons are active, then you're paying attention to that point in space. If another set of neurons are active, you're paying attention to that point in space. So if this bump of activity in your brain has a harder time moving around, it's harder for, it would be harder to move attention around, right? And velocity goes right to that. They, yeah. Some of their games are. Some of their games are exactly, yeah. To watch the so, yeah, and, and working memory, right? So working, your, your ability to, like there's a task called digit span, which is how many digits can you remember? That's thought to be correlated with IQ, for example. Uh, so your ability to remember online many, many things uh, seems to be correlated with ge more general measures of intelligence. Uh, but it's kind of a, a weak thing because many IQ tests essentially measure working memory span. So it's kind of a chicken and egg thing, right? Um, but yeah, so working memory, attention, just anything that would exercise those things would be probably good. Yeah. Tom? So I guess the question, you talk a lot about these networks trained to run time back and see the original pattern. Right. Uh, what sort of applications are you thinking for this technology in regards to the sort of controlled mechanism you were talking about in the early part? The controlled me mechanism? Well, sort of neural, neural oh, like oh is it? Yeah, so this, I, I don't think um, the brain is doing anything like this. Uh, this is kind of a spin-off application, just, just an engineering application. Um, the major, one of the major unsolved questions for training in the brain is called the credit assignment problem, right? If you, if you hit a tennis ball wrong, right, which of your 10 to the 14th synapses screwed up, right? Major problem. How does the brain know how to solve that problem? I.e., how does the brain assign credit or blame to the correct set of synapses to solve that problem? When we train these neural networks, you, we used an algorithm called backpropagation that a lot of people use to solve that credit assignment problem to, to figure out which synapses screwed up. But we don't think the brain does that in any obvious way. Um, so that's a major unsolved problem. And, and you know, we're starting to think about it. But, but uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh, yeah. Um, do you have any data that comes from that that could be used? For example, there are some claims about deep brain stimulation being used to create a very short term uh, somewhat like um, powers. Ah, interesting. Things like that. So, is there okay. any data? So, ironically, I'm. Yeah, I'm meeting with a Stanford neuroscientist tomorrow to work on a grant on <coughs> deep brain stimulation and trying to understand it better. Um, I, I don't know about the idiot savant stuff, but deep brain stimulation has found clinical uses in alleviating depression. Uh, and it, it actually sort of works well. People don't really know how it works. Uh, also, deep brain stimulation can be used to create new circuits in your brain. So people study plasticity where you stimulate one part of your brain and you record in another. And you keep doing it. And then you find that the strength of connection becomes stronger uh, once you keep doing it. And they've actually recently found that neuromodulators play a role in that. So they knock out various neuromodulators, which are chemical forms of transmission in the brain, and they don't see that plasticity, right? So the stimulation is, is doing something very, very complicated. It's electrically stimulating neurons, which are then releasing chemicals, which then modify the transmission of information. It's a hornet's nest. We don't understand it fully, how it works. That's actually one of the amazing things about most medical interventions. We have no clue how our medicines work especially in the brain. Um, 
Uh, yeah? That grid section with the rat is fascinating that they uh -huh. have a sill that fires off when it recognizes a border as a landmark. I was wondering, is there a temporal aspect to it too? Say if the rat move was blocking the straight line for five seconds, it should see a, a landmark that recognizes a border, that a cell would fire off saying enough time has gone by, you should be able to block oh. Yeah, so what they have done, right? So, so, okay, so if you see these cells, let's say the rat is moving and, and, and you see the cells firing kind of regularly, is the cell counting time or is it counting space, right? So the easiest way to do that is to dissociate time and space by changing the velocity, right? So, so you can make the rat move fast through the track or make it move slow through the track. And it turns out the cell fires exactly when the rat gets to a particular position. Right? not how much time it's taken to get to that position. So it really seems to be counting space as opposed to counting time. Now prediction, okay, so people have done this alternating T maze where the rat goes up and it's supposed to go left one side, then come back to the bottom of the T, then go right, then come back left, then come back. So it has to alternate. So when it's going out, in order to do the task correctly, it needs to remember which branch it took of the T it took the last time. And then they kind of, some, some people see uh, activity patterns in the rat's brain that can predict or are correlated with which direction it's going to go, right? So that's sort of, it's a weak correlation, but, but it's sort of there. Um, yeah, that, that's as close as, yeah, in this system they've gotten to sort of prediction. Yeah, you had a question? Yeah, yeah I have a question. I'm not real sure where it is yet, maybe I'll, uh, the observation, I'm not, driving down the street and a squirrel going across the road. He sees me coming, I see him, I don't want to run over him, he doesn't want to be run over by me. Yeah. He'll um, exhibit what I call rational behavior and all of a sudden just do something totally random, just weird, like he'll come back out in front of the road. Yeah. And uh, I'm wondering, is, is there some synapses all firing simultaneously yeah in, so in prey species rather than predators. yeah so squirrels definitely did not evolve to avoid cars right <laughs> but but what they might have evolved is to avoid detection by predators that can detect motion right so a lot of animals exhibit a freezing response right in fact that's how they can look at the neural correlates of, of uh, fear right because they can tell when a mouse is afraid because when the mouse is afraid, it freezes, right? And it kind of makes sense, right? These hawks are moving, or, or any kind of bird is moving above the mouse. And if the mouse is moving relative to its environment, the hawk can detect it easily and swoop in. So now the mouse can detect motion, right? It's an adversarial game where the mouse can detect motion in the sky. And then it'll get scared and it'll freeze, right? So freezing is fantastic if you're being hunted by a hawk. Not so good if you're getting run over by a car, right? But evolution isn't fast enough to deal with cars, right? So from your perspective, it looks irrational. But from evolution's perspective, it might be completely rational for a different situation that evolution didn't design the rat for, right? or the squirrel for. Yeah. I just want to say, I will use that anecdote at parties from now on. <laughs> I just made that up, so I don't know if it's true. <laughs> but it sounds right, right? <laughs> Anyways, yeah. Oh yeah, so it's, it's um, just the ganglion cells, right? So we know that the ganglion cells are a bottleneck, right? The ganglion cells are the only cells that go to the brain. So if we record from the ganglion cells, then we know exactly what the brain has access to, right? But, but it's very hard to record from both the ganglion cells and higher cells in, you say, your visual cortex or in your lateral geniculate nucleus, which is a way station from the retina to the visual oh, so cortex. That's true, yeah, that's exactly true, yeah. So what people often do is they, they record slightly off of the fovea because there's lower density there. And the electrodes, uh, the electrode spacing isn't quite fine enough to record from the fovea because it's so high density there. But, but people try that as well, so, but, but a lot of the recordings are slightly off of the fovea, yeah. Well, if you'd like to 
Vito, our speaker, will be here for a few minutes, so come on down to the front, but let's thank uh, Dr. Gambulli.